this is great. I love when people travel from far away to come be with us. Jeff and Tracy Carmichael are here with us today from Tennessee. I have relatives in Tennessee. So it's a good place. I'm glad you all made the trip up here. Um, they came for a specific reason, though. It's not for me. For these two young people on each end, they're kind of like bookends. Now, I know this one over here had a birthday yesterday. Isabel, 13? Wow. I'm doing okay. And then this one on the right over here has a birthday today. Lauren, 15. That's pretty good. You know, and these parents over here, you guys don't look old enough to have kids at all. <laughs> but isn't that great? Hey, give them a round of applause. Okay. Next, talking about birthdays. Genevieve Hare is going to be 90 this month. And I had this special invitation brought to my house by her son, the oldest one, Dennis. And so I'll read the invitation because it applies to everyone. We, the family of Genevieve Hare, will be having a 90th birthday celebration at the Wolf Creek Event Center that's in Cast Isle across from the library on July 23rd from 2 to 5 p.m. Please, no gifts, but your presence would be greatly appreciated. So I will post this up on the bulletin board, but that's so neat. Um, Genevieve and I have had a wonderful time for the last 22 years, haven't we, Genevieve? <laughs> yes, and so this is this is really neat. In fact, 10 years ago, I was involved in a surprise birthday party for Genevieve. And, and they came to me and they said, could you get her to the party secretly? And I said, sure. And so we used to, Genevieve would accompany me to nursing home, east side, on Sunday afternoons, every now and then, to do a service. She would play, and then I would speak after we let him in song. So I just told Genevieve, I said, hey, we got to go to the nursing home on such and such a day. And she's like, sure thing. And I said, I'll pick you up about the normal time, which was 2 o'clock. And they're expecting her there between 2 and 2.30 and pick her up. And so I pick her up, and it's like, but we're not going the direction we normally go. And I said, you know, they told me down there at the Cast Isle Church, they wanted some flowers to be taken up to the nursing home. So we're going to drive over there and pick those up. And she goes, no problem. And then we pull up there and she goes, you know, she goes, I started recognizing people going into the building. And then I said, oh, you got to come with me inside. And uh, then it was a great celebration and a great surprise. And, and then her family told her afterwards, we feel so bad. We, we made your pastor lie. <laughs> that, 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 really, that really bothered the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so now I get to see him 10 years later and say how I felt. <laughs> so be sure, plan for that. That would be great. Um, the next thing is, last week I had mentioned about our picnic coming up the last Sunday of this month, the 31st, and it's going to be at Star Park in Leicester. And so Denise has now put up a sign-up sheet. We'd like to know how many are coming so we can prepare adequately hot dogs and hamburgers to fit the amount. So please be sure and put your name up there if you're coming. And we're going to plan to do it after the morning service, probably about 12.30. So I'll give you time to rush home and change and get what you need and then join us out there. And then, um, let's see. Am I supposed to talk about this? Okay. Where are these? Oh, back by the offering plate on that table. No, I changed my mind. I moved up. Where are they? Okay, why don't you do that? When we greet, why don't you go get grab them? Okay. And then everybody will just go to you if they want them. Okay, this right here is the invitation for Vacation Bible School. It's going to be July 18th through 20th, 22nd. 
all the information is on there. It's an invitation that you can hand out to families with children and whatever. They can put it on their fridge, and this will remind them to come. So again, she's made a bunch of these. So uh, I just told her to go get them. And so then sh just see her, and she'll give you, you know, as many as you like. But this is very crucial as far as getting children here. Okay, the next thing is um, we are in the process of uh, redoing the pew Bibles that are there. And so in the back, we have two samples on the baptistry table. Um, one is giant print and one is large print. Okay, and they're side by side. If you forget, just look at the front sleeve cover and it'll tell you large or giant. Now what we want you to do is there's pieces of paper there and a pen. Pick which one you think is better. If it's giant, write giant. If it's large, write large. Fold it and put it in the basket. Then we'll determine which one we're going to purchase to put in the pews. Okay? Well, like I say, I said the giant's on the left, the large is on the right, and if you're confused, look at the leaf cover and make your decision, okay? Um, let's see, what else have I forgotten? Okay, um, a couple prayer requests um, I want to mention. Um, first of all, Dwayne Madison has a medical appointment this week concerning his lung condition. So we want to encourage folks to really be in prayer for that situation. I know he was able to share with me last Sunday just about some of the side effects of his lung condition and how it's affecting him. And so it's not easy. So really, we covet your prayers for Dwayne, and he's on the prayer list. Be, be in prayer for this. It's very important. And then secondly... I got a phone call yesterday from Eric Droma. He's a teacher at the Letchworth School, and he had come and spoke here for me back in February when I had to be absent, just uh, unexpectedly. And he's a leader in the Perry Baptist Church. And so he called me yesterday and just shared with the fact that they are without a pastor, and it's not easy right now. It's kind of rough going to find a pastor, and it's not it's not working very well. And so he was coveting my prayers, and I'm sharing it with you. I said I put it I couldn't put it on the prayer list for today, but it'll be next week. But pray for that congregation um, that they'll be able to Lord will lead the right pastor to them. And uh, I really appreciate Eric very much. He's a very godly man. And he's in charge of leading the search. So a lot of stuff is on his shoulders. And then um, last thing I wanted to do, this is the 4th of July weekend, and I'm just a history person all the way through and through, especially American history. And this comes from a book that I read, well, quite a few years ago, but it's all about George Washington's life. And the author here really points out a lot of things that say that he was a godly Christian. But this is just an excerpt, just to go along with our thoughts about the 4th of July. Washington was a member of the first two Continental Congresses. Thus, he and a handful of other Virginians journeyed to Philadelphia to meet together with other delegates representing the other colonies. Out of these colonies, the United States of America was born. As surprising as it sounds in a secular America, the first act of the first Congress was to pray, despite a myriad of Christian denominations represented. John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail explaining what happened on September 6, 1774 and September 7, the first two meetings of the newly formed Congress. This prayer not only began America, but it began the continuing congressional tradition of prayer and the work of chaplains among our government officials. A famous painting from the mid-19th century depicts the classic scene of Reverend Duché praying. George Washington was one of those at prayer as well, and in this portrait, he is kneeling. 
as the work of Congress proceeded, they decided to appeal to England and to reason with the mother country to show the errors of its misguided efforts to force the colonies to pay taxes that were inconsistent with the British Constitution and legacy of liberty. The Congress began with a recitation of history, whereas the power, but not the justice, the vengeance, but not the wisdom of Great Britain, which of old persecuted, scourged, and excited our fugitive parents from their native shores, now pursues us, their guiltless children, with unrelenting severity. These words raise a critical point. Many wish to separate the settling of America, which was Christian, from the founding of America. Thus, in this view, the settlers were Christian, but the founders were secular-minded. But the early but the early Congresses did not adhere to deism, including the very first Congress which recognized that our fugitive parents came to these shores to flee persecution. Congress went on to resolve that it would be wrong not to stand up to their current persecution at the hands of Great Britain in the light of the sacrifice of the settlers of America. That is, it is an indispensable duty which we owe to God, our country, ourselves, and posterity, by all lawful ways and means in our power to maintain, defend, and preserve these civil and religious rights and liberties for which many of our fathers fought, bled, and died, and to hand them down entire to future generations. How, they ask, could they live down their fathers, the settlers of America, or their posterity if they allowed England to run roughshod over their religious liberties. Washington and his congressional patriots believe they owed it to their God and their country to stand boldly for their heritage of liberty. That's what we're celebrating this weekend. That's what our country is all about. It's a good place for us to start. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, we again humbly bow before you because you are a Father worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise and all glory. As we come before you right now, we think of this weekend as this is a very, very important weekend in the history of our country. And we look back to those who were at the very beginning of it and it seems, as we've learned and as we've read in many places, that these men were committed to you, committed to establishing a country that was far different than any other country that existed in their time. And here we are, over 200 years later, still enjoying the benefits of what these men attempted to do at the risk of their lives. We know when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they said, well, we're, we're all going to hang together if they catch us. But this is a worthy cause that we'll commit ourselves to. And so here we stand, celebrating what these men courageously did in the sight of you, wanting to establish a new nation born in freedom how we enjoy this freedom so much. Father, as we continue to pray, we do think of those that are on our hearts and minds. I think of Dwayne Madison and what he's going through with his lung condition and how it's affecting him. And we know he has an appointment this week and we would pray, Lord, for help and strength. We pray that the best possible outcome and the appointment would happen. <coughs> But we also, Lord, know that it's our job as brothers and sisters in Christ to continually encourage and do all the things that we can to help in this challenge. And then we also think of our sister church in Perry, Baptist Church there, what they're going through in a transition and realizing uh, the need that they would really enjoy the fact of having a pastor again. And so I pray for Eric Drummond and the leaders that are involved in this search 
that you will guide them and direct them to the best possible candidate. We also pray, Lord, for the church in this time in transition that you'll continue to keep them unified and strengthened. It's a challenging time for a church to be without a pastor. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to accomplish and for your presence here among us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the first hymn that we want to sing this morning is number 804. <coughs> number 804. And uh, I'm going to ask you to, after you find your place, to join me in standing. And we are going to sing three verses. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the fourth. And now when we get done, we're going to greet each other. Okay, so stand up and sing verse one, three, and four.
hadn't picked that one, but she played it so good that I'm going to change and we're going to sing that that she was playing. So uh, number 799, or 799, when you find your place, I'll ask you to stand. And then we're going to sing um, the first and the last verse, okay? First and last. So when you get your place, 799, join me in standing. someone's load 
by simply giving them our undivided attention through listening patient, then we're to do it. In this example, I'm often reminded of my interaction with Betty Godin throughout our time together. She taught me much about this trait expressed by Paul. And some of you remember Betty. Well, this is what Betty normally would do with me. I would be home working Tuesdays or Thursdays. And I've got caller ID. And inevitably, I'd see on my caller ID, Betty Godet. And I'd go, well, I know this is going to take about an hour to an hour and a half. And so it was right in the middle of whatever I was doing. And so I learned to put aside what I was doing and talk to them. And many times she was calling simply for the fact is she was lonely. And she wanted to have conversation, meaningful conversation with somebody. And uh, at the beginning of it, in the beginning of this process, it was like, I got work to do in my mind. I'm going, I got work to do. I got, you know, and then over time, I began thinking, you know, what's the most important thing here? It's not your work. It's big. And I would say that I didn't learn this myself. She taught me. She taught me. Lightening the load of the week is only a part of the purpose. <coughs> as Paul explains. Look at verse 2. He says, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now, edification is the idea of building strength where it might be lacking. Therefore, we do what is good for them in terms of what? Helping them grow and develop. I mean, all of us should have this experience in this realm if we've been, what, parents. Or if we've been, what, grandparents at some time in our lives. I mean, we are accustomed to doing what is best for young children. Even though it might not be what we would like to be doing. One of the best ways to instill strength in the young is giving our time and taking advantage of the time to teach them some important truth when they are what? All ears. And we know what that looks like when they are all ears. Now Moses wrote, you must think constantly about these commandments I'm giving you today. You must teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home. Well, that's a novel idea. Or out for a walk. Well, that's another good place. At bedtime. That's a great time. Or how about the first thing in the morning? And he says, tie them to your finger. You know, I've often seen in modern cinema that idea of tying something to your finger is to remember. He says, wear them on your forehead. Hey, use your mind. Think about it. Write them on the doorpost of your house. As you're going in and coming out, it's a sign. You see, the strong should want to see the weak become strong. And the only way to do this is to aid them in developing strength. And this is going to take time away from what you'd rather be doing. But I think the truth of the matter is, it's worth it. I don't think any of us would go back and look on time spent with children or grandchildren and go, oh, that was a waste. I'd rather have been doing this. No, we look on that and we go, that's the most precious time. And I'm building something in them so that they'll grow up strong. It's the same idea in the family of God. Now, the greatest example of this type of service toward the weak is Jesus Christ. How so? Look at verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Now, this is a prediction. 
that Jesus would suffer some terrible treatment as he did God's will on the earth. You see, he faced all the anger and all the frustration that others felt towards God as he represented God. You mean, it's kind of like, we don't destroy the message. What we do is we shoot the messenger. Jesus was the messenger. In this world, he certainly faced many choices in which his divine attributes would have made his life so much easier if he had just simply chosen to please only himself. But Paul explains our attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. What's he saying? He relinquished the independent use of his divine attributes to live a fully human existence on earth. Now imagine all the circumstances he faced with, within which his divine attributes could have lessened the burden he was feeling as a human being. I mean, one example is the temptation to satisfy his hunger after a long period of time with Satan nagging at him and nagging at him. But Jesus told him, no, for the scriptures tell us that bread won't feed men's souls. Obedience to every word of God is what we need. You know, he could have easily turned stones into fresh bread, but he didn't. Because pleasing himself wasn't the top priority. Obedience to the Father and helping weak souls was the priority. Jesus knew that he would have to die like a criminal on a Roman cross as he waited to be arrested. And how did he react to this decision? Are you ready for this? My father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken away from me. But I want your will, not mine. Now, it's obvious he wasn't demanding that his way be first over the mission to help weaker souls to be saved. Now, how weak were the souls which needed him to do this? Well, back up to chapter 5, right there in Romans. Chapter 5. Look at verse 6. Paul gives some very interesting descriptions to how weak the souls were that Jesus was trying to help. How weak were they? Look at verse 6 to begin with. He says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Hey, did we have any strength to do anything right? According to what Paul said, no. Boy, that's, that's a serious weakness. He also talked about the fact we were ungodly. We were the opposite of God's holiness, not by accident, by choice. That's real weak. Well, look at verse 8. He goes on, he says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sinners. What does that mean? We were addicted to sin, and we would not stop. Boy, that's weakness. And then look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We fought against God as his enemies of everything he is everything he does. And I'm sure at some point in our lives it would be real easy to shake our fist in God's face and say, just leave me alone! That's how we do it. And that didn't stop Jesus. 
in spite of all the reproaches that Jesus endured from people like us, he stayed the course for our good instead of what? Pleasing himself. Now, how can we do any less for those who might be weaker than we are and struggle in life? How can we do any less? Especially if they share the faith with us. They believe in Jesus Christ and we believe. Now, how did our Lord become so strong in this human effort to do God's will for the purpose of saving weaker people like us? I mean, he lived his life as a human being. So how did he become so strong, humanly speaking, to help weak people? Let's go back to chapter 15 and look at verse 4. Here's the answer that the apostle gives us. He says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. When it comes to learning how to do right in a sacrificial manner, there's no better source than what? The scriptures. All of the scriptures were intended to teach us how to do right in any given situation. I mean, we can read about example after example of perseverance and the encouragement gained from staying the course over time. And these examples give us confidence in God's way and about God's will being what? It's the absolute best choice. And this is the resource which Jesus had to study as a human being for the mission that lay ahead of him. Did it equip him properly for what he endured in this life? What's your answer? Absolutely yes. Listen to a summary of this resource, which we can study just like Jesus studied. The writer of Hebrews says, it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all the other prophets. These people all trusted God and as a result won battles, overthrew kingdoms, ruled their people well, received what God had promised them. They were kept from harm in a den of lions and in a fiery furnace. Some through their faith escaped death by the sword. Some were made strong again after they had been weak or sick. Others were given great power in battle. They made whole armies turn and run away. And some women through faith received their loved ones back again from death. But others trusted God and were beaten to death. Preferring to die rather than turn from God and be free trusting that they would rise to a better life afterwards. Now, folks, none of these examples were easy choices for the people involved. But they chose the path of doing good for others above their own desires to please themselves. These examples and the instructions in the scriptures can help us make the same choices too. Can we as a body of believers put aside our individual differences by just reading alone? And the answer is no. Look at verse 5. Paul says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, According to Christ Jesus. What's he doing here? He's praying. He's praying. We can't forget the necessity of praying or asking God to help us have the mind and the attitude of Jesus in serving others. And what exactly are we praying for? Paul explains it this way. He says, don't be selfish. 
Don't live to make a good impression on others. To curry favor with them. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't just think about your own affairs. But be interested in others too. In what they are doing. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave or servant. Now, Jesus told his disciples, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for men. Now, if God answers our prayers to be like Jesus in our thinking and to be like Jesus in our attitudes, what could the result be? Look at verse 6. He goes on, he says, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying here, we could all be on the same page internally and externally which is going to heighten our ability as a group to glorify God how? as one this happened to be the prayer of Jesus on his very last night before he got executed he prayed my plea is not for the world but for those you have given me because they belong to you and all of them, since they are mine, belong to you, and you have given them back to me with everything else of yours, and so they are my glory. Did you ever think of yourself as being the glory of Jesus Christ? That's what he's saying. Now I'm leaving the world and leaving them behind and coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your own care. All those you have given me so that they will be united just as we are with none missing. I'm not praying for these alone, but also for the future believers who will come to me because of the testimony of these. And my prayer for all of them is that they will be of one heart and mind. Just as you and I are, Father, that just as you are in me and I in you, so they will be in us, and the world will believe you sent me. There's nothing which can compare to the body of Christ glorifying God with one heart and one voice, as Jesus emphasized. It certainly makes all the differences, all the differences, seem small compared to this purpose. This idea of creating greater unity among us as believers in Christ is something the apostle would like to build on. And we might say, well, how exactly build on? Well, look at verse 7. Here's something very interesting. He says, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. That is something. Let us receive each other in a manner which resembles how Christ achieved his mission of taking us in to the kingdom. I mean, what he did definitely brought glory to God. And we can bring glory to God in the manner in which we receive one another. That's a very interesting statement. Let's examine what Jesus did in bringing Jews and Gentiles together into his kingdom. Look at verse 8. Paul goes on and he says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So we understand Jesus came as the Jewish Messiah to reach the Jewish people. How does he do this? He acted according to the truth of God 
and affirmed all the promises made to the patriarchs long, long ago. He didn't overlook any promise or prediction in order to fully identify himself to the Jewish people. He bent over backwards in this identification. He certainly devoted much of his time and effort to reaching out to them in spite of what? They had a very, very negative attitude towards him. Isaiah wrote about the Jewish people's reaction in this way. We despised him and rejected him. A man of sorrows acquainted with the bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him. And we looked the other way when he went by. He was despised, and we didn't care. Can you imagine that? And yet Jesus kept reaching out to those folks. Well, how does that compare to his work in helping, well, Gentiles? That means if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. Look at verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles. And sing unto thy name. We as Gentiles are the outsiders. With nothing to look forward to like the Jews. And therefore his mercy had to be doubly great for us. You see, we were the worst of sinners in view of our depravity. Unlike the Jews who lived morally superior lives to us, we were the bottom of the barrel. But the prediction which Paul quotes informs us that Jesus would, in fact, reach out to Gentiles as he did during his ministry. And he would lead them to worship his Father in heaven. Did we deserve a look? Not by a long shot. And this wasn't the only prediction of mercy to be shown to us as Gentiles. I mean, Paul attests, it was predicted long ago. He's going to reach the Gentiles. Look at verse 10. Notice, and again, he said, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. <laughs> I love it. Why do you love it so much? I'm a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. The mission of Jesus was to save both Jews and Gentiles. And then do what? Unite them into one group. As he stated to the Jewish people in Jerusalem, he said, I'm the good shepherd and know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And then he said, I have other sheep too in another fold and I must bring them also and they will heed my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Now folks, that was before it all happened. Bringing Jews and Gentiles together. And again you go, uh, I wouldn't want to be the one to bring those two groups together because, well, they're kind of like feuding brothers. Won't have anything to do with each other. And if they do see each other, they're bound to sock each other right in the face. But it was accomplished. Here's what Paul wrote. Listen to this. He says, Never forget that once you were heathen, speaking to us, and that you were called godless and unclean by the Jews. But their hearts too were still unclean. Even though they were going through the ceremonies and the rituals of the godly, for they circumcised themselves as a sign of God. Remember that in those days you were living utterly apart from Christ. You were enemies of God's children. And he had promised you no help. You were lost. 
without God, without hope. But now you belong to Christ Jesus. And though you were once far away from God, now you've been brought very near to him because of what Jesus Christ has done for you with his blood. For Christ himself is our way of peace. He's made peace between us Jews and you Gentiles by making us all one family, breaking down the wall of contempt that used to separate us. By his death, he ended angry resentment between us caused by the Jewish laws that favored the Jews and excluded the Gentiles. For he died to annul the whole system of Jewish laws. Then he took the two groups that had been opposed to each other and made them parts of himself. Thus he fused us together to become one new person. And at last, there was peace. As parts of the same body, our anger against each other has disappeared. For both of us have been reconciled to God. And so the feud has ended at last at the cross. And he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were very far away from him and to Jews who were near. Now all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, may come to God the Father with the Holy Spirit's help because of what Christ has done for us. Isn't this great news for everyone in God's kingdom? What has brought us together, meaning Jesus, is far, far greater than any difference we might encounter because of what? Our backgrounds. We should be able to build upon what Jesus did, laying a foundation by receiving each other in the same spirit in which he brought us into his kingdom. In conclusion, let us place our hope for a better unity in God who brought us together in the beginning. Look at verse 13. He says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Through our faith in Jesus, we can grow in joy. We can grow in peace. With who? With one another. We can be certain and assured that this unity we seek is going to come to pass. What's the guarantee? God's Spirit at work in our lives. And if these things flourish in each of us, we're going to have a greater opportunity to be united rather than divided. We can be transformed from selfish people into unselfish servants of God and one another. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, we just are overwhelmed when we think of how far you have brought us. How easy it has been in our natural lives to be selfish and hateful, to write others off, to do all the things that show that we really have no love in our heart for certain individuals. And then you sent your son Jesus to change us. Mission of salvation. To give us a brand new life and a brand new heart and a brand new mind. And we think about how hatred used to be the first priority in our lives and now you've replaced hatred with love. Love for other people. In the family of God, people that we might have thought of before as, I never want to be close to that person. I never want to have anything to do with them. But now that Jesus has come and changed us and 
and he's also changed others. And now we stand side by side and we realize that once where hatred existed, now there's absolute love. And we love people that are in the family of God. Whereas we would never think of wanting to do anything with a particular individual. Now, because we're both in Christ, it's easy to say, hey, let's do lunch. Let's spend some time together. And we realize that the result is not because of anything we did. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done. We realize that at times, Father, we struggle with certain things in our lives that make us a little more unfriendly to others, a little more unloving to others. And for that, we repent. We ask your forgiveness to take those things out of our hearts and minds when, when we allow those things to begin to happen inside of us. Sometimes it's just a matter of a perception looking at somebody and thinking ill of them when there's really no reason for it. So we confess that in those times of weakness, help us. We need your help just as much as anybody else in the family of God. Help us as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning. We realize communion is recognizing that time and place in which we trusted in Jesus the very first time and what it took for him to save us. We realized that we weren't the best people in the world to be saved. In many ways, we were the worst. And yet, your son never gave up and never stopped reaching out to us. That's why we love him so much and we love you so much. So help us now as we prepare our hearts for this sacred moment of communion. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have Beth just play uh, one verse of a hymn, and that will allow you to prepare your hearts for communion. Um, the other thing is, with many folks visiting with us for the first time while we're doing communion, um, we would welcome you, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to partake. If you happen to never have made that decision, this is really for folks that have made that decision. So what do you do in that situation? You just simply allow the elements to pass and don't partake. And that's just showing you're showing respect. Respect for Jesus Christ. But that's going to play and we allow time to prepare your hearts and minds for Thank you.
668, we're on the third verse.
just short, but I love the idea with what we've been seeing. So make me a servant. And why don't we sing through it twice? Continues, and he says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. God, would you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we, we think on this day as we think about the independence we gained from England and the blood that was shed so that we could have that independence. We also think about the bondage of sin that we were in and the independence that you gave us from that bondage by the shedding of the blood of your Son, and that blood wiped away our sins so we might be free. And we thank you for giving us this gift of the, of the sacrifice of your Son that we today might be able to have a relationship with you. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Tim, we're going to sing and we'll be dismissed is right across the next page, 670. <clears throat> we'll sing the first and last verse, and when we finish, we're dismissed. And I'm going to ask you to join me in standing as we sing this last hymn.